All right, so in this video, what we're going to look at is the actual chapter 23 homework. We covered most of the concepts and theory in the first video. So if you haven't watched that yet, I do recommend you go back and review that. But if you have, then this is the correct spot for you to be. So hopefully this will make some sense. We're going to kind of move through this fairly quickly since we took about 30 minutes and discussed a lot of the concepts earlier. So we'll just kind of read through it. And if you do have any questions, always feel free to reach out and contact me and let me know what those questions are. Otherwise, let's begin. So in this first question, what it's going to have us do is identify any relevant costs. So in the first video, we discussed what the definition of a relevant cost was, but what it really boiled down to was that this is something that is going to change based on the decisions that I make. So in this case, we see Helix Company has been approached by a new customer to provide 2,300 units. And it's regular product at a special price of $6 per unit. The regular price is $8 per unit, and Helix is operating at 75% of its capacity of 10,300 units. Identify whether the following costs are relevant to Helix's decision as to whether or not to accept the order. So, in this case, we looked at 2,300 units, and so what we need to first figure out is if I've got a total capacity of 10,300 units, and I am using 75% of that capacity, then what I wanna know is do I have enough idle capacity to actually be able to fill this order without having to make some changes? And the answer here is yes, because if I take my 10,300 times 0.25, what I come out to is 2,575. So I've got 10,300. I'm sorry, that's in highlighter. Let me flip back to my pencil. So we've got 10,300 units times 25% idle capacity. And that tells me that I've got 2,575 units that I could be making that I'm not making right now. So we're using idle capacity, which means we've got a little bit simpler calculations because He's only wanting 2,300 units, which means we've actually still got idle capacity of 275 units, even with this. So if we had another customer you know, who wanted a little bit more, we haven't used up all of that idle capacity accepting this order. So this tells us, identify whether the following costs are relevant as to whether or not we should accept the special selling price. No additional fixed manufacturing overhead will be incurred. The only additional selling expense will be 60 cents per unit shipping cost. There will be no additional admin expenses because of this order. And then we want to identify relevant or irrelevant. Well, the selling price of $6 per unit, of course, will change if we decide to accept this. So that is definitely relevant. The next piece is the direct materials cost of $1 per unit. Well, if I don't accept this order, I don't incur those. So that is definitely relevant. Direct labor of $2 per unit, once again, if I don't accept this order to produce these 2,300 units, I don't have to pay that direct labor on those 2,300 units. Variable manufacturing overhead of $1.50 per unit, also relevant. That will not be incurred on these units if we do not produce these units to begin with. Fixed manufacturing overhead of $0.75 cents per unit. Well, if it's fixed, then that is going to be incurred regardless, and so that is not relevant because that's not going to change with this decision alternative. Regular selling expenses of $1.20 per unit. Well, those would have been incurred regardless of whether or not we produced more units. So that is not relevant. Additional selling expenses of $0.60 cents per unit. That does change. So that will be relevant because that would not have been incurred if we had not taken this order. And finally, administrative expenses of $0.70 cents per unit is not going to be relevant because that's not changing between the decision alternatives. Now, on to number two, we're going to look at if these statements are true or false regarding relevant costs. So it tells us a sunk cost will change with a future course of action. Well, of course, that is false. If you watched the first video, you know that a sunk cost is something that's already been incurred that cannot be changed or avoided. So we know that is false. Number two, incremental costs are relevant costs. And we said basically in the first video, those are almost interchangeable, right? Because they are really telling us the same thing. Now, number three, it tells us avoidable expenses would continue even if a segment was eliminated. That is, of course, incorrect. What they mean here for that to be a true statement is that this is what we call unavoidable costs. 
Sunk costs do not change with future actions. That is true. That's pretty much included in the base definition of a sunk cost. And finally, out-of-pocket costs do not require future cash outlays. No, no, no. They do require future cash outlays. So out-of-pocket costs require future cash outlays is how that would be made to be true. But as it is, that is false. Okay. So we are now done with number two. Moving on to number three, we're going to look at our first decision that we talked about in the first video. And this is where we deal with the decision to make or buy a product. So it tells us here the Gilberto company currently manufactures 80,000 units per year of one of its crucial parts. Variable costs are $2.70 per unit. Fixed costs related to making this part are $90,000 per year. And allocated fixed costs are $77,000 per year. Allocated fixed costs are unavoidable whether the company makes or buys the part. And Gilberto is considering buying the part from a supplier for a quoted price of $3.90 per unit guaranteed for a three-year period. So we want to calculate the total incremental cost of making 80,000 and buying 80,000 units. And the question then is, should the company continue to manufacture the part or should it buy the part from the outside supplier? So that's what all this work is going to be doing for us on the next three pages. So in the first part here, it tells us that the relevant cost per unit is $2.70. And if you look, here it is right there in that very first line. It tells us Gilberto Company currently manufactures 80,000 units. Variable cost, $2.70 per unit. So we just drop that right here. Now, the next thing that we've got to look at is exactly how many units that we are making this for. And so to go from this $2.70 per unit all the way to this $216,000 that you see right here, all they did is they multiplied this by the number of units, which in this case is the 80,000 units per year. And that's all they did to get over there. Now the next piece here tells us that the fixed manufacturing costs that we would incur as a result of this are $90,000 per year. So it says, Fixed costs related to making this are $90,000 per year. So that is relevant because that will change in the decision. If we choose not to produce this good, then we will not incur that $90,000. So that $90,000 is indeed relevant. So our total relevant cost then is $306,000 if we decide to make this product. Now, for the next piece, what we've got to look at is the cost if we buy this product. This one's a little bit simpler. In this case, all we're going to do is we're saying that we needed to purchase 80,000 units. So if I take my 3.9, multiply that by $80,000. So I take my $3.90 purchase price times 80,000 units. What I'll come out to is $312 thousand dollars and you see that up here it tells us that we can purchase this at three dollars and ninety cents per unit guaranteed for a three-year period and that would be for the eighty thousand units okay and so that tells me my total cost then is this 312 so the question is well if it costs me let's do a recap down here at the bottom to make it cost me three hundred six thousand dollars to buy, it cost me $312,000. Well, assuming all else is equal, which one is better for the company? We're just going to go ahead and make this product. And that's what we'll see on the next slide. And sure enough, it tells us our decision is to make the product. And that is because we are saving $6,000 by choosing to make this rather than buying it from the outside supplier. So that's all that there is to this question. I do want to draw your attention to this note down here at the bottom, just so you do see this. It says, recommendation, note that the allocated fixed costs of 77 are not relevant because they will continue whether the part is made or bought. So what they're telling you here is that this allocated fixed cost of 77000 per year does not need to be included in this calculation. It is simply there as extra information trying to throw you off. Don't let it. Okay, so be very careful. That's all that that says. And so therefore, we actually save $6,000 by making the part. 
Now the next question is where we deal with selling or process further decisions. And in the first video when we talked about this, we talked about the example of a peanut farmer. We said if you grew peanuts, you can sell just raw peanuts as they are, or you can actually process them into something like peanut butter. So in this question, we're going to look at a little bit different example, but let's see how this works. So this tells us that Kobe Company has already manufactured 25,000 units of product A at a cost of $30 per unit. 25,000 units can be sold at this stage for $420. Alternatively, the units can be further processed at a $300,000 total additional cost and can be converted into 5,300 units of product B and 11,800 units of product C. Per unit selling price for B is $104 and for C is $51. So what we've got to do is say, well, what can we do to figure out if we should sell these items as they are as product A or if we should process these and actually turn them into products B and C. Well, they tell us initially that the actual selling price as product A is $420,000. So we can just fill that in and we're done with the sell as is column because no further changes are needed. So for the next column, what we need to do is figure out exactly how much in sales we would have. So it tells us here that we would convert this into 5,300 units of B. So I'm just going to put a B. I'm going to say 5,300 U. And I would multiply that by my selling price for B, which I kind of covered it up. So let's see. It's $104. So I'll multiply this by 104. And when I do that, I will get $551,200. Now for product C, I then say, well, it looks like we can make 11,800 units of product C. I'll multiply that by a selling price of $51 and get $601,800. When you add that up, you'll get $1,153,000. And that is where they get this value right here. It's just the sum of those two selling prices. And that's all there is to that part. Now be careful when you're making this decision do not decide if you should sell it as is or process it further based on the revenue. The revenue is not enough. As you see, regardless if this ends up being a good decision or not, the actual revenue will increase. And that's because originally we are only able to sell this product at $30 per unit. However, by doing this additional work, we've bumped the price on some of that up to $104 and some of that up to $51. The revenue will always be higher under the process further option because if it wasn't, there would be no reason to do so. What will maybe make this not always work out is these additional costs. So make sure you do not forget to account for the actual cost of transforming product A into products B and C. We can't just snap our fingers and magically make A turn into B and C. There's actually some work that has to be done. So in this case, the question tells us the units can be further processed for $300,000 in additional cost to convert into product B and product C. So that's where this $300,000 right there comes from. Now, the total relevant cost then, in this case, the only cost that is changing as a result of choosing to process further is that $300,000. So then if I take my $1,153,000 less my $300,000, what I'll come out to is $853,000. Now, this is what we can get if we process it further. But if we had sold it as it was, then we would have gotten $420,000. So my incremental income is $433,000 by converting these into products B and C. So since this right here, this 433, is greater than zero, right? It's positive since we're actually earning more money in my incremental income, then the company should process the goods further. And that's what we've just seen here. So now we've wrapped up number four, and we will move on to number five. Now in number five, it tells us a company with excess capacity must decide between scrapping or reworking units that do not pass inspection. So what we're going to have to look at here is how the company will decide what to actually do. So this tells me that the company has 16,000 defective units. They cost 
and 70 cents per unit to manufacture. The units can be sold as is for $2.80 each or reworked for $4.80 each and then sold for full price of $8.50. So, in this case, if we sell these as scrap units, then what we get to do is take these 16,000 defective units, multiply that by the amount that we're actually able to sell it for, which is $2.80. So, if I take my $2.80, I multiply that by 16,000 units, I will calculate $44,800, which goes right here as my selling as scrap material. However, if I rework these goods, then I can sell all of them, all 16,000 units at full price, which is $8.50. I'll take that by my 16,000. And when I do that, I get $136,000 in revenue. Now be careful that you don't just take this as revenue, like we said in the last question and run with it and say, oh, we should go ahead and rework. Reworking is not free. Because it's not free, you must consider the cost associated with this. So it tells us that the cost associated with fixing each one of these is $4.80. I'll then multiply that by my 16,000 units. And when I do so, I see that this comes out to be $76,800 that will have to be subtracted from that revenue. Now I'll take the sum of these two, my 136,000 in the positive, and my negative $76,800. And when I take that netting, what I'll find is that I'm actually getting, in the end, $59,200. And once again, that's just the netting of the 136 and the 768. So now the decision part comes in and we say, well, incremental income, if we sell this as scrap, is basically $45,000. But if we go ahead and rework this, then what we see is that this actually comes out to be a balance of $59,000 roughly in incremental income. And so we're able to move through it as such. And so in the end, you see the incremental income, right where we're looking at right here is this line. That incremental income is larger for the rework side. And because it is larger, that tells me that I want to rework the product rather than sell it as scrap. Now, number six, what we're going to look at here is how we handle sales mix, but more specifically with a constrained resource. So when we have a constrained resource, how do we handle this? And really, constrained can be interchanged with the word limited, if that makes more sense. right? We've got a limited resource, a constrained resource, where we can't meet demand on everything all the time. So we're going to have to make decisions to determine which product we should be producing the most of. So it tells us here, Childress Company produces three products, K1, S5, and G9. Each product uses the same type of direct material. K1 uses 5.1 pounds, S5 uses 4 pounds, and G9 uses 5.2 pounds. So demand for all products is strong, but only 53,000 pounds are available. Information about the selling price per unit and variable cost per unit of each product is shown below. So what we're going to want to do is I'm going to want to set up a table. The table is going to be set up pretty much like we see here below. And what I'm going to have to do is figure out the contribution margin per unit. Now, what I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to just follow down below these columns, right? So I'll do it below product K1 will be for product K1, below product S5 will be for product S5, and below product G9 will be for product G9. So the way we're going to calculate this contribution margin per unit that you see here is the same way we've done it up till now in the semester. But just to reiterate that, we're going to take selling price minus the variable costs, and that will give me my contribution margin per unit. So for product K1, that'll be 175.01 .01 less your $98, which gives us a contribution margin per unit of $77.01. Then for product S5, we will take the selling price of $111.20 less $78, which will give me $33.20, 
for my contribution margin per unit. And for product G9, we'll do the same thing and take selling price of $200.04 less $147.00, which will give me $53.04. Now, the question here is which one of these products should we produce the most of or should we fill orders on first? Now, are we done with the question? And the answer is no. I cannot just make my decisions based off of this row because what we now need to consider is how much of each material each product requires because it may turn out that a product with a lower overall contribution margin per unit actually has a higher contribution margin per constrained resource. So or in this case, per pound of this limited resource. So now what we'll do is we'll have to just come back up to the reading and see exactly what they told us. So they told us here that K1 uses 5.1 pounds, S5 uses 4 pounds, and G9 uses 5.2 pounds. So then we just fill those numbers in right here. We're then able to come in and with just simple division, we divide 77.01 divided by 5.1, 33.2 divided by 4, and 53.04 divided by 5.2. When we do so, what we'll see is that product K1 has a contribution margin per pound of constrained material of over $15, product S5 only $8.30, and product G9 of $10.20. So what that tells me is if I'm receiving orders for these products, and I can, assume I could only sell product K1, I would be totally fine with doing that because I'm receiving such a large contribution margin per pound. However, while it says demand is strong, it is unlikely demand is high enough to completely be filled and to allow us to use all 53,000 pounds on only product K1. For that reason, once we've produced enough of product K1 to fill the demand that our customers have, the next product we should produce is product G9. And finally, if products K1 and G9 cannot fill the total demand for our customers and we still have leftover resources, then and only then we should produce product S5 because it has the lowest contribution margin per pound. And so we're not maximizing that level of income or those resources if we start producing S5 instead of K1. So be careful there. Make sure you understand how this works. Hopefully not too terrible. It's just a lot of moving pieces. But a lot of this is similar to what we've done in the past. Now we're really just bringing in that interpretation and that analysis level that's kind of been left off until this chapter. So hopefully that makes sense, and we'll move on to number seven. Now, number seven, we're going to look at eliminating departments. So this is a big question. There are six departments, or I'm sorry, five departments and a total that we're going to have to look at. And so what this question is going to do is give us different scenarios and see what happens to income when we eliminate different departments. Now, the first scenario says management looks at the estimated financial statements or the estimated financial results. And they just say, we're going to eliminate all departments with expected net losses. So you say, well, which departments have expected net losses? Well, that's department N, that's department P, and that's department T. So that means we are eliminating three of my five departments. Now, if I just tell you that, you might say, well, that doesn't sound very good. And in this case, you're right. And that's what we're going to see through the process of doing this question is that even though these departments had expected losses, we'd actually be better off most likely if we left a couple of them running perhaps. And so as we work down through these questions in number seven and eight, that's what we'll hope to see. So right here for department M, all we're going to do is copy the numbers straight down from Department M. And actually, I'll do this in green for the departments that are actually still running. So Department M and Department O, we'll just copy those results straight down because there's no changes. Now, in Department N, what we're going to have to do is look at how the costs, or I'm sorry, yeah. In Department N, we're going to have to look at how these costs actually fall out. So in the very beginning of the last video that we did, we talked about what was called avoidable 
and unavoidable costs, right? Whenever we hit this piece on analyzing the effects of eliminating departments, we said it may not be enough to just look at the total costs that go into that department. We actually need to look at what is avoidable and what is not. So when we're looking at the costs incurred by department N, the costs that are avoidable, those will not be transferred down to the bottom because they are avoidable and we have closed that department, which means that $44,000 in department N that was avoidable, we no longer have to pay. The same will then be true for departments P and department T. Okay. So the next piece is, well, what do we do with these unavoidable costs? So with these unavoidable costs, I'll do these in purple. Well, these unavoidable costs of 19800 46000 and 18000 those are still going to have to be paid. And you see that right here. Because whether that department is running or not, those costs are still incurred. The company cannot avoid them. So if we just run a quick total on that, let's see how much that actually comes out to. So we've got $19,800 in Department N, $46,600 in Department P, and $18,200 in Department T, which means from the eliminated departments, so from eliminated departments, I've still got $84,600 in unavoidable expenses. Which tells me that now I've got zero income to offset this $85,000. That doesn't sound very good. And what we'll see is it's not very good. So that wraps up number seven. And I really just show you this just so you can realize why this might not have been a great decision even before we see the math on the next page. Because before we at least had some income to offset perhaps some of these unavoidable costs. That will no longer be the case. So in number eight... What we do is using the same information, now it tells us management looks at this a little bit differently. And instead of eliminating every department with an expected loss, we only eliminate departments with sales dollars less than avoidable expenses. So in that case, we are only going to eliminate departments N and department T. Because if you look... Down in the table, right, and I just copied this information from the prior page just so we wouldn't have to go back and forth, back and forth. What I'm going to see is that, and I'll do this back in red, the sales in Department N are $41,000, but the avoidable expenses in Department N are $44,000. And the sales in Department T are only $40,000, but I can avoid $49,000 which tells me that in both of those departments, I'm better off by shutting them because the sales are outweighed by the amount of expense I can save. But if you look at department P, which we did eliminate before, you will now see that even though it does have an overall loss, it only has $20,000 in avoidable expenses where it has $60,000 worth of sales. What that tells me then is that $40,000, right, so $60,000 minus my forty, I'm sorry, minus my $20,000 tells me that I have $40,000 that can help cover my unavoidable expenses. And if I shut this department, then I am losing that full $40,000. Of coverage. So we don't want to shut down Department P, at least not yet. In the future, if Department P ends up having more avoidable costs than sales, then that would be the time to look at closing Department P. But for now, Department P is okay. And so now when we actually fill in this table, we're going to do it much the same way as we did a minute ago. So we're going to say Department M, Department O, Department P are all going to just be copied straight down. So M, O, and P 
all get copied straight down into this table because they're all left operating, which means we still have their sales, we still incur their avoidable expenses, we still incur their unavoidable expenses. So those three just fall straight through. However, Department N and Department T now are changed because we no longer see, and we'll do this in the red, we no longer see their sales. Those are now zeroed out. And we no longer see their avoidable expenses because those are now being avoided because we no longer have to pay those expenses. So now when I come down through this, what I'll see is that my net income ends at a positive $8,600 before my net income finished at negative $31,400. You say, well, why is that? So let's just throw this up on a number line just to help us see it. So before, we were at negative $31,400. Zero is, you know, the break between our positive and negatives. And now, we're at $8,600. You say, hmm, what could have brought us from here all the way to here, and it's this $40,000 that we talked about a moment ago. Because we now have $40,000 to go toward covering these unavoidable costs, it actually swings us from a huge loss of almost 31, or a little over $31,000, all the way up to an income, a positive net income here of almost $9,000. So it's a huge swing, and that's because we allowed, in the second scenario, for Department P to continue operating even though we expected it to operate at a loss. So what that means is don't be rash and start closing departments because you think they're going to lose you money. They may lose you money, but if their sales are more than their avoidable costs, you're going to be hurt more by shutting those departments than by allowing them to run at least until their sales are outgunned or outweighed by those avoidable costs. If that ever should happen, then that department should be looked at for being eliminated. But until that point, allow that operation or allow that department to continue running. Now, number nine, what we're going to look at is we've got two options. We are going to either keep a machine or we are going to replace that machine. So it tells us here that Zen Hong Company is considering replacing one of its manufacturing machines. The machine has a book value of $45,000 and a remaining useful life of five years, at which time salvage value will be zero. It has a current market value. I think that says $55,000, but let me clear my writing. So uh, $55,000. Variable manufacturing costs are $33,800 per year for this machine. Information on two alternative replacement machines follows. So it tells us here to calculate the total change in net income if alternative A or B is adopted. And should Jin Hong or keep or replace the manufacturing machine? If the machine should be replaced, or which alternative should they purchase? Okay. So that is what we're looking at here. I'm just going to clear out all that so we can read that a little bit easier. And in this case, for alternative A, it tells us the cost of buying alternative A is $120,000. And we just see that right there. So we just drop that in. Now it told us the current market value was $55,000 for the old machine. So all I'm going to do, drop that in right there. And finally, the reduction in variable manufacturing cost is going to be $57,000. And you say, wait a minute. Where did this $57,000 come from? And that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because it means you're paying attention. This is not actually given in the question. What is given is the current amount that is incurred in variable manufacturing costs per year for the old machine. We are then also given the variable manufacturing costs per year of alternative A. If I take that difference of 33800 minus 22400 and I then multiply that by the number of years left, which in this case was given as five years, so I'll multiply that by 5. Then what I will get is $57,000. And so then we are saving $57,000 in variable manufacturing cost. 
So now I just take the sum of these three items. Whoops. Of these three items. And 120 minus 55 minus 57 gives you an $8,000 change in net income. But you'll notice that was a $120,000 expense and we're only getting $112,000. So it's actually a decrease in net income of $8,000. Now, one thing you may be saying to yourself is, this is all well and good, but this does not consider the time value of money. And you are absolutely correct. This decision does not consider the time value of money, at least not in this chapter. Time value of money is discussed in chapter 24. So if you want to see how that impacts any calculations, please feel free to look at chapter 24. But for chapter 23, we are not dealing with the time value of money considerations. But I'm glad you brought that point up because it means you're really thinking through exactly what is happening in this type of situation in the real world. So that brings us to the end of alternative A. Now for alternative B, we're going to do the same thing. In this case, alternative B costs a little bit less than alternative A. It costs $116,000. And the variable manufacturing costs per year here are only $10,500. So the cash I'm going to receive is still $55,000 because that's my market value. So that still drops right there. My reduction in variable manufacturing cost here, though, is absolutely massive. Because before, with my old machine... My variable manufacturing cost per year, $33,800. I then need to subtract what the new variable manufacturing costs per year are for this machine of $10,500. I'll then multiply that by my five years that were left. And when I do that, I see I'm saving $116,500. So in this case, the savings are actually so large with this even if I received nothing from my old machine, I would be better off buying this new machine. It's absolutely an incredible machine, it looks like. So in this case, the reduction in variable manufacturing cost plus my cash received exceeds the cost of the new machine by a whopping $55,500. So you say, well, what should we do? Should we keep the old machine? Should we purchase machine A? Or go with alternative A, or should we go with alternative B? So let's look, but hopefully you got it. We are going to go with alternative B, and that's because we are seeing an increase because alternative B is increasing my net income by $55,500. And we see that right here. Now, of course, this is without considering the effect of taxes and everything else, but but it's still a very large increase nonetheless. And so we are going to go with alternative B. Now, in question number 10, what we're going to look at is accepting new business or maybe not. All right, so we've got someone who wants to do business with us, but now we've got to decide, is doing business with them going to help me. So in this case, it tells us that Gosford Company produces a single product and has capacity to produce 190,000 units per month. Costs to produce its current sales of 152,000 units follow. The regular selling price of the product is 122 per unit and management is approached by a new customer who wants to purchase 38,000 units for $79.20 per unit. If the order is accepted, there will be no additional fixed manufacturing overhead and no additional fixed selling and administrative expenses. The customer is not in the company's regular selling territory, so there will be a $7.80 per unit shipping expense in addition to the regular variable selling and administrative expenses. So, in this case, it tells us we need to calculate the combined total net income if the company accepts the offer to sell additional units at the reduced price of $79.20 and then determine whether management should accept or reject the new business. So in this case, what we're going to have to do is come in here and see that my normal volume of sales, my 152,000 units, 
All right, so I'll just jot that down, 152,000 units. Then I will take that times my selling price of 122, and that brings me to this 18,544. I'll then do the same thing all the way down for direct materials and, it, and all, but they actually were nice, and they gave me those numbers. So for all of these, I'll just take my 1,900,000, drop it, my 2,280,000, and drop it straight in, 2,128, 2,128,2,660,2,660,2,280,2,280,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128,2,128